So I think we're still waiting for Emma, but I'm going to go ahead and get started, I think. Uh, Okay, um, hello and welcome. Um, we are so excited to have you all here at the symposium. And before you begin your presentation, please clearly state your name and title of presentation. Um, I will be here as a moderator to assist you with timing and will be giving verbal five minute and two minute warnings. It's very important that we keep moving along. So as a reminder, the format will be 10 minute presentations with all questions saved until the very end. Um, and this time presenters, please turn on your camera if possible and a reminder to stay muted until it is your turn. And uh, anyone who's using PowerPoint, please make sure you have your slides ready to share. And as a reminder, you're not to go over 10 minutes. So I will say stop at the 10 minute mark at which you should finish your sentence or thought before we have to move on. And once someone is finished um, or stopped sharing, the next person can go just right ahead. Um, so it's my pleasure to welcome the first presenter, and I believe we have a recorded lecture for the first one. So I'm going to pull that up myself. Alexander Coley. I'm a senior at the University of Hawaii at Hilo. Today I am presenting for you a project entitled Body Politics, Traditionalism and Adaptation in Titus Andronicus. Let's Mark to Shakespeare's first complete tragedy by its production in 1594, the most lamentable Romaine tragedy of Titus Andronicus receives less stage presence than its more popular theatrical successors. And frankly, granting the contents of the play, its limited stage light is understandable. Titus Andronicus chronicles the fall of its eponymous protagonist Titus, an aging Roman military general who has just returned home victorious from the front line. He brings in tow his, quote-unquote, spoils of war, the goth queen Tamora, and her three royal sons. The plot then follows a complicated series of tit-for-tat cruelties, beginning with the execution of Alarbus, Tamora's eldest son, and climaxing with a dinner party, wherein Titus honor kills his daughter Lavinia, murders Tamora, and then himself finally dies at the Roman emperor Saturninus's hands. Saturninus is then killed by Titus's eldest son, Lucius, who, with the approval of the Roman public, secures his position as the next emperor. But like any Shakespearean tragedy, it is not just Titus Andronicus's carnage that unsettles its audience. Really, the most perturbing aspect of this play are the implications it leaves audiences to grapple with, specifically those made of the dangers of traditionalism. This demonstrates an unwavering faith to the Roman state and its body of laws and precepts, yet never reaps any kind of enduring benefit from his loyalty. In fact, it is this very loyalty that consigns Titus, along with many of his children, to their demise. Now, you may find yourself wondering how exactly does traditionalism actually beget the near total destruction of the Andronici clan? The first action that demonstrates Titus's blind conservatism and thus brings him a little closer to his impending doom is unsurprisingly also the catalyst of Tamora's fatal grudge, the murder of her eldest Alarbus. In the play's first scene, Titus and Lucius, also an accomplished military general, weigh their losses, 21 of Titus's 25 sons having become casualties over the course of the war. Lucius cries out to his lost brothers, invoking the Latin phrase ad manus fratrum, which loosely translates as to our brother's spirits, this being a call to Rome's practice of ritual sacrifice. Titus, the only one vested to grant such a request, immediately hands over Alorbus to be executed by fire, despite Tamora's entreaty for mercy. Defending his choice, Titus coldly recites Roman law, saying, religiously, the surviving soldiers ask a sacrifice. To this your son is marked, and die he must. As Mike Wilcox notes in his historical analysis put to silence, the nature of Titus's justification is crucial. Titus does not weigh against Tamora some equal paternal woe, though he could, like a religious zealot. 
Treatises on critical adherence of tradition is reason enough for him to refuse her pleas. Notwithstanding his facilitation of Lucius's revenge, Titus is not actually emotionally invested in the execution sentence he gives. To call back to Wilcox, Titus sees the sacrifice as both patriotic and religious duty rather than an act of personal vengeance. Thus, despite being purported as the bastion of Western civilization, Titus's traditionalist habits paints Rome as, to quote Mora, a place of cruel, irreligious piety. A society whose senseless traditions appear to revel in needless violence and Titus, in spite of his outwardly honorable nature, is among the last to challenge these illogical practices. Titus' obedience to the Roman state also renders him a direct actor in the violence that afflicts his family. This begins with Titus's promotion of Saturninus, the eldest son of Rome's late emperor, over Bassianus, his younger brother. Titus himself is offered the role of emperor but declines. Titus is then advised by his own brother Marcus to support Bassianus's ascension, as he is the people's preferred choice. But Titus refuses his reasonable options, supporting the corrupt Saturninus on the grounds that, by virtue of being the older child, he inherits the title by tradition. The consequences are immediate. Lavinia, happily betrothed to Bassianus, is courted by Saturninus. When she refuses his hand in marriage, she's labeled treasonous, and Tamora inveigles her way into the empty conjugal bed, making herself the Roman empress. Lavinia flees the court with her brother's aid, but not without casualty. Titus accosts one of his own sons, Mutius, and executes him for disloyalty to the empire. Observing from a distance, Lucius exclaims, My lord, you are unjust. In wrongful quarrel, you have slain your son. Expositing further that Saturninus's edict and Titus's enforcement of it illegally interferes in another's lawful promised love. This detail is loaded with crucial implications. Titus's obedience to Roman tradition is not only dangerous, it is dangerously confused. Titus's uncritical loyalty puts him in a paradoxical bind, one where the empire both obligates him to kill a beloved son, as well as abet Saturninus in transgressing the very laws his filicide means to uphold. The most damning act of traditionalism, however, waits until the play's very end to rear its ugly head. Early on in Titus Andronicus, its heroine, the gracious Lavinia, Rome's rich ornament, is brutally victimized. Tamora's surviving sons, Chiron and Demetrius, rape Lavinia, then hack off her tongue and hands to prevent her from reporting the crime. To convey the details of her assault, Lavinia uses a staff to write Chiron and Demetrius' names in the sand. In Titus's eyes, however, Lavinia has not only indicted Tamora's sons, she has secured her own death sentence. Showing the lengths of his commitment to Roman tradition, Titus invites Empress Tamora and Emperor Saturninus for a supposedly conciliatory dinner, featuring pies baked with Chiron and Demetrius' remains. After revealing these special ingredients, Titus kills Lavinia, slitting her throat over the dinner table. Echoing his religious rationalization of Alarbus' death, Titus proceeds his fatal act with the Roman legend of Virginius, who similarly killed his daughter so she could quote-unquote not survive her shame. Thus, in his blind commitment to his nation and its cultural precedents, Titus both initiates Tamora's revenge and destroys his daughter for suffering the consequences of it. Lavinia's death is especially distressing for its gruesomeness, of course, but even more so for its thematic power. In order to illustrate this point, I'd like to bring into the dialogue Julie Taymor's 1999 film release, Titus. Taymor's characterization of Lavinia is a salient component in this adaptation. Where some stage productions ham up Lavinia's piteousness, Taymor's Lavinia is passionate and resilient. When she accuses Chiron Dimitri, she does so in a fit of visible rage, using both mouth and arms to furiously, but deftly, scrawl out their names. As the film reaches its end, she appears happy to assist her father as he drains her rapist of their blood, using her mouth to catch the drip in a bowl as Titus, having lost his hand to another of Tamora's plots, cannot achieve the task without help. Tamor's adaptation perfectly underscores what Carolyn Lamb in her paper, Physical Trauma and Adaptability in Titus Andronicus, remarks. At both the metaphorical and physical level, Shakespeare endows the disabled body with the capacity to heal or adapt itself. The video's adaptability thus sets her apart from her beloved father. Where Titus falls back on tradition for salvation, consequently incurring further harm to his family, Lavinia's willingness to adopt new methods of communication and action sets up a solution to traditionalist thought, a solution that ultimately enables Lucius' ascension to emperor. As such would not be possible had Lavinia not taken some form of agency in her revenge on Chiron and Demetrius. 
Additionally, it is significant to note the inherent meaning in Lavinia's name. Lavinia is the feminized form of Latinus, a derivative from Latium, the city from which ancient Rome first sprung forth. The symbolic suggestions of this name cast Lavinia as Rome personified. This becomes disturbing when considering the lengths to which Lavinia is objectified. As Alice Equestria explains in her paper, Rome's Rich Ornament, Lavinia, through lapidary descriptions of her being an ornament, is reduced to an object to be employed in rites of gift exchange. Judith Butler theorizes in bodies that matter. The social construction of a body is marked not by a set of actions performed in compliance with the law, but rather the body is mobilized by the law, both regulated by social expectations as well as shaped by the lived contestation of said expectations. This is certainly true for Lavinia, who must regulate as an item even as she takes agency in her revenge. After all, vengeance against her rapist is only secured with the silent promise of her own death, as Chiron Demetrius's defilement of her renders Lavinia a damaged good in her father's eyes. And being the abstraction of Rome herself, Lavinia's death highlights the damage that traditionalism has done unto the whole of Rome by ushering in Saturninus's short reign. Simultaneously, contestation to Roman tradition, which manifests as Lucius's unconventional ascension to emperorhood, provides the empire with an opportunity to continue on. Besides being fatal, Titus Andronicus's climax ultimately proves the futility of traditionalism. Titus's choice to kill Timora, his empress, is a clear violation of his loyalty to the Roman throne. Lucius takes his father's treason a step further by ending the life of Saturninus. In spite of Titus's best efforts to preserve a traditionalist Rome, the empire changes drastically, and all that's to show for his attempts is a pile of dead bodies, himself among them. Shakespeare's message is almost painfully clear. Social and cultural changes will happen regardless of whether or not you'd like them to. Embrace them. Encourage them, even, lest you find yourself facing the consequences of blind conservatism. Uh, so next, if, um, if, uh, let's see, Elena, is it? Could go next? Eliana. 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 I'm so sorry. Eliana. No, it's totally okay. Everyone, everyone does that. All right. So hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Eliana Wilhelm. I'm a junior at Houston Baptist University. And today I'm going to be reading for you all an abridged form of um, my essay, She's Not the Man, The Unsexing of Lady Macbeth. Of all of Shakespeare's tragic female figures, Lady Macbeth is generally acknowledged as his most wicked woman. Her bloodlust and passion for power, leading her to spur her husband toward the act of regicide, and finally her own tragic end of insanity and despair, all begin with one fateful scene, the unsexing of herself. The loss of all things fertile, feminine, and in fact human are stripped from her so that her desire to become wicked will not be hindered by her womanly qualities. It is not simply a transformation of outward appearance, but of her biological makeup, eventually affecting her mental and spiritual state. There are a number of theories as to why Lady Macbeth commands evil spirits to come and unsex her. The most reasonable being that in order to fulfill her duty as helpmeet to her murderous husband, she must become a source of death instead of a source of life. So first one needs to understand the ramifications of this unsexing. Um, Jenna Joy LaBelle writes, when Lady Macbeth commands the spirits of darkness to unsex her, it is not just a wish for psychological movement away from the feminine. She is asking the spirits to eliminate the basical, basic biological characteristics of her sex. This is not simply a disguising of how one presents their gender, which is a common theme in a number of Shakespeare's plays, but rather is a full surrendering of the characteristics of her sex in a way that cannot be undone or reversed by a change of one's clothes. Um, she asks the spirit to make thick my blood, sop up the access and passage to remorse. She's not asking for her blood to be poisoned or made more strong or more resolute for the task that is ahead, but rather this is a literal request for her menstrual cycle, the process by which a woman is able to conceive and eventually give birth to cease. 
Renaissance medical texts generally taught that the blood from the womb interacted with the blood in the heart. So the state of the womb would also be the state of the heart and soul. Further, the end of menstruation and end of fertility also meant the cessation of the formation of mother's milk. Lady Macbeth asks that instead of milk, her breasts be filled with venomous liquid called gall. As the blood which feeds remorse ceases to flow, Lady Macbeth demands that in its place, she is filled from the crown to the toe top full of direst cruelty. This transformation, which Lady Macbeth commands, fully obliterates all sense, semblance of fertility and the ability to nurture a child, which would be expected of her as a wife and queen. Uh, this transformation goes further than just physical ramifications in entering the spiritual ones. She calls upon evil spirits to unsex her because it is unnatural for a woman to desire murder. And therefore, if she wants to stay dedicated to her husband's treacherous plot, she needs to cease being a woman. After her transformation, her husband is very aware of this and says that she should only bring forth men children only if she were to have any more children because she has just lost all nurturing characteristics. So there's a number of other uh, theories beyond just this like kind of demonic uh, transformation that people have given for why Lady Macbeth um, commits this unsexing. One theory is that she's unhappy being in a role where she has to submit to her husband. So she has this transformation in order to usurp his authority. Um, in the play, we see that she is definitely the more dominant figure while her husband is more submissive. And at that time, that would have been seen as incredibly wicked, incredibly controversial. And some have seen that as one of like the central evils of the play. Another um, potential theory for an explanation of her unsexing is the idea that she's not only trying to usurp her husband's authority figure, but she's trying to assor assert um, the male figure upon herself. Shakespeare's tragic women frequently recognize the inherent weakness assumed of their sex. In another tragedy, in Julius Caesar, Portia bemoans her gender and prays that she might remain constant in her resolve because she realizes, I have a man's mind, but a woman's might. How hard is it for women to keep counsel? She knows it is disadvantageous for anyone with wit or will to be female. Other characters in Shakespeare's plays have, descri have disguised their gender, such as Viola in the comedy Twelfth Night or Imogen in the romance Cymbeline. Yet Lady Macbeth is the only character who actually commits a complete unsexing, a transformation that is never reversed. Um, and these other theories, while they have um, as some argument to them, they don't adequately explain her decision to completely unsex herself. While she is a more dominant figure and while her husband does submit to her, um, she frequently encourages her husband to be more masculine and in a sense pushes him to be better for the leadership role, even though she would be more well suited to him. She tells him to uh, screw his courage to the sticking place and he'll not fail. During Shakespeare's age, it was believed that women were made to be helpmeets, following the Christian tradition of Eve, the first woman, being created from the rib of Adam, the first man. It is worth arguing that while Lady Macbeth does counsel her husband to do things that she wants, these actions always end up dire uh, directly benefiting her husband. Um, the three witches in the beginning of the play, tell Macbeth that he's going to be king and he immediately writes his wife. She does not plant this idea of regicide in his head, but rather nurtures what already develops. She doesn't urge him to commit any acts. Thank you. She does not urge him to commit any acts, which he does not already wish to complete, but is urging him on his quest, even when his own courage fails. So usurpation doesn't make sense as a sole motivation. As for him wishing to become her wishing to become a masculine figure, um, the Elizabethan understanding of menstruation, fertility, and blood doesn't support this theory. Um, one scholar writes that blood produced and understood as produced in the liver as liquidized food was considered the most vital of the humors and was believed that blood formed the basis of all elements of the body. Um, the most life-giving elements of blood under the Galenic four humors mo uh, model was that of male sperm and female menstrual blood. So the understanding of sex was that male and female were essentially the same and the male anatomy was simply an inversion or the female anatomy was simply an inversion of male anatomy. So when Lady Macbeth asks for the blood in her womb to be stopped up, that would be a complete um, ending to her fertility and human uh, reproductive 
uh, aspects, regardless of if she's attempting to be male or female or not. Um, she doesn't ask for anatomy to change. She doesn't ask to father children rather than nurture them. She simply wants to not bring forth life in any capacity. Um, so according to Susan Zimmerman, Macbeth represents a realm that is worse than death because at least in the imagination of its protagonist, nothing is totally obliterated, nothing is final. The evil in this story is not simple. Lady Macbeth tries to cast off her femininity and in effect her humanity so that she might assist her husband in his murderous ascension to power. At first glance, it se might seem that this unsexing is done so that she might usurp the role which her husband refuses to play. However, her dedication to the cause that originates from her husband and her lack of actual usurpation in his role, along with her tragic demise after her brief rise in power, seems to indicate that she was content to be her husband's helpmeet. She is not always satisfied with his lackluster expression of his masculinity and frequently encourage or rather heckles him to be better, but she does not take her husband's stolen crown from his undeserving head. It is easy to assume that Lady Macbeth's unsexing is intended to show a turn towards masculinity as the theme of what it means to be a man and to be a woman is pervasive in this text. However, careful research, particularly that of Renaissance medicine, more clearly indicates that Lady Macbeth's motivation is not to become male or to usurp the crown, but is rather to become simply demonic and inhuman. Thank you. Um, so up next is uh, Katie. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. <laughs> um, would it be possible for me to share my screen? Ah, uh, yes, I just allowed it. So. Oh, great, thank you. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Katie Painter and I am a student at Yale University. So from crafting witty asides to breaking the fourth wall to staging plays within plays, Roman dramatist T. Machius Plautus often infuses his work with the art of metatheater. Scholars have long debated the precise definition of metatheater. However, we can understand the term broadly as drama about drama or any moment of self-consciousness by which a play draws attention to its own fictional status as a theatrical pretense. This essay consisting of three parts investigates Plautine metatheater as a means of social critique. Today we'll focus on the second part of my essay which frames Palaestrio the clever slave for Miles Gloriosus as a paradoxical figure who simultaneously upholds and destabilizes social convention in his role of playwright. At first glance, the outcome of the Miles might lead us to interpret this work as the pinnacle of subversive stagecraft. After all, our story ends with the provocative image of the major Pyrgo Polynikes naming his slave Palaestrio as his conqueror and acknowledging that justice has been served. Taking such moments into account, Kathleen McCarthy identifies Palaestrio as a clear manifestation of the farcical or transgressive mode in Roman comedy, which she opposes with the naturalistic or stabilizing mode. I want to suggest, however, that Palaestrio does not leave the world completely upside down and therefore cannot be understood as completely farcical. Instead, I propose that Palaestrio simultaneously upends and restores the established social order, crafting a distinctly subtle critique of Roman society that sows the seeds of doubt without directly advocating for radical change. In many ways, of course, Palaestro is the archetype of the Servus Callidus in Plautine theater. While a clever slave appears in many Roman comedies, this figure plays a uniquely exuberant part in Plautus's work. Palaestro casts himself in this role most clearly when he sketches out the plot of his second trick. Here he assumes a position of leadership and begins telling his co-conspirators exactly what to do, as if to provide them with stage directions. His use of the phrase in particular, id quod augitor in this speech, echoes the line, dum haec augitor fabula, from the prologue of Plautus's Menechmi. His imperative, anima mad also appropriates a command typically given to audience members at the onset of a performance. This explicitly theatrical language confirms that Pleistro is not just the mastermind of a prank, but in fact the writer and director of his own play. Accordingly, he also adopts the verb decet in these lines, granting himself the power to determine what is right and proper from this point forward. Thus he launches into the details of his plot, true to the form of the Plautine Servi Kalidi, who donned the, quote, magic armor of wit, and, quote, possessed the imagination to remake the world and themselves. In doing so, he invites us to explore a fictional land 
or the lower orders of society to rise up to take control over their own destinies. Throughout the same scene, Palaestro strengthens his claim to the role of playwright by manipulating the identities of those involved in his trick. He envisions the details of the prostitute's disguise, for example, reminding his co-conspirators that she must stay in character in order for the trick to work. As he invents a new name for the girl, Dikea, and weaves her into his grand scheme, he evokes the image of a playwright spinning characters out of thin air and promptly dismissing them at his own discretion. Noting derisively that the major Prigger Boy Nikes fancies himself a, quote, Alexander, he frames his victim as one more character to claim for his own. Thus, he aligns himself once again with the Roman poetae, who, like Plautus himself, reappropriated Greek figures into their own plays. Significantly, Palestrio's rule redefinition here comprises far more than humorous diversion. In fact, it carries very real consequences in the world of the Miles. As Timothy Moore observes, Plautine metatheater tends to further the action of the play rather than appearing only in backhanded comments or allusions. Fitting himself neatly into this pattern, Palestrio seizes metatheatricality as a means of control obtaining the privilege to determine what happens both in the trick and in the larger world of the play to which he belongs. At the same time, however, Palaestro also reinforces the play's more naturalistic tendencies, reaffirming the familiar slave-master dynamics embedded in Roman society. To understand Palaestro in this somewhat counterintuitive light, we must first recall the prologue in the Menaikmi, insisting that all theater is only temporary. If we follow his logic, the world of the Miles Gloriosus constitutes a kind of holiday for real life an occasion to cast aside our traditional experience of the world and revel in the novelty of the imagination. In this view, Palaestro's scheming takes on the character of Saturnalia, the Roman festival during which masters would provide table service for their slaves for one night each year. The inherent irony in this ritual is, of course, that it relies on the institution of slavery itself. The slave's very participation in the festivities presupposes his status as a slave. Paradoxically, then, we can understand the Saturnalian ritual as, quote, temporary anarchy that implies order. Palaestro devises a similarly carnivalesque inversion of the social ladder in Miles Gloriosus, upending society for one brief moment before vanishing along with the rest of the play. And just like a Saturnalian celebration, the thrill of the whole affair relies on social standards remaining intact beyond the spatial and temporal limits of the stage. Palaestro's genuine loyalty to Plusicles, his former master, also establishes a more naturalistic dimension to his character. In the prologue of the Miles, Palestrio tells us that he has devised a trick with the express purpose of luring the major out of his attachment to Philocomasium, and thereby reuniting her with Plusicles. In this passage, Palestrio makes clear that his motivations transcend his own self-interest. He differentiates himself from the typical clever slave in an Adelus Gaines and Senex paradigm, where the slave indulges the lustful yearnings of the young man to just stage a joint rebellion against the hierarchy of both the family and the established social order. Palestrio, by contrast, takes the side of true love rather than lustful debauchery, breaking up one domestic union, but restoring another at the same time. Thus, he remains at least partially subservient to external authority. He typifies the virtues of a good slave in his devotion to Plusicles while rejecting these same virtues in his hatred for the master. On another level, Palaestro's devotion to reuniting the two lovers also leads him subservient to the genre of comedy itself. The love plot that Palaestro works to resolve is a defining feature of the Miles that helps situate it in the tradition of Greek New Comedy and Fabulae Palaeotae. As Palaestro propels us toward the play's resolution, he uses this character to drive his own plot forward and establish himself in the world of Roman drama. Thus, he reminds us that the engineering playwright we see on stage was first engineered by another engineering playwright, namely Plautus himself. But while Plautus felt Palaestro's selfless devotion renders him subservient. It also invites a more destabilizing question about the humanity of slaves. If, as Plautus ventures to suggest, the slave is capable of great emotional depths of devising magnus machinas at his own peril, the audience cannot help but question his standing in the social order. Indeed, Palaestro's loyal, empathetic stance renders him more humane than someone as bestial and repulsive as the major, who, unlike Palaestro, would have been considered fully human under Roman law. As David Christensen observes, Roman comedy often exposes this kind of elaborate social script underlying Roman life with its manufactured hierarchy of slaves and ma masters, network of patrons and clients, and array of social rituals that were performed throughout the day. As Roman playwrights toyed with these structures in their plots, they left the Roman audience with a model for evaluating their own social lives. In this same way, the Miles invites its viewers to take a second look at the roles that they have assign one another in real life, and ask themselves whether or not they really find these roles to be justified. So in conclusion, Palaestro both challenges and reaffirms the social status of the Roman slave in his moments as playwright. On the one hand, he topples the major in a spectacular display of brilliance and cunning. At the same time, however, his self-conscious staging evokes the fleeting carnivalesque atmosphere of the Saturnalian rituals that paradoxically rely on the institution of slavery itself. Finally, he displays a fervent loyalty to his former master and even comes forward as subservient to the genre of comedy itself. 
These distinct elements join together to reassert the boundaries cross and put Palestro back in his place on the fringes of the Roman social order. But as Palestro's clever mind and loyal heart fade out of sight, Plautus plants a seed of doubt about the justice of his subordinate status. His query rings out centuries into the future, where, as I argue in the third part of my essay, the figure of Shylock from Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice builds on this very Plautine dynamic established in Palestro, the playwright slave. Thank you. Yeah. And I don't believe Emma is here, but um, if they are, please correct me. Um, so um, thank you everyone that presented today. You did a fantastic job. So I'd like another virtual round of applause. Um, and at this time, the panelists are now gonna take questions from the audience and even some fellow panelists if they have questions themselves. Um, to do so, just please unmute yourself to ask a question. You don't really need to raise your hand or anything. Um, and you can always type a question in the chat and I will be Sorry, reading those I'm to the like, panelists so as well. So we may begin um, when ready. So I'm having to screen record it. And yeah, so there's a part of me that's like, I should just wait until it's over and then I'll go. But I'm like, it's 540. I have a question for Eliana. Uh, so you acknowledge that I, Lady I, Macbeth I, wants to be a source of death it. instead of a source of life. Do you think that's why she and Macbeth don't have any children that are acknowledged? Like, do you think this was a long-seated well, uh, longing sure that she had? Well, that, oh, I'm so glad you asked this question because there's a portion of my essay that I wasn't, well, there's a lot of portions of my essay I wasn't able to talk about because of the time constraints. But um, there's actually a really fascinating theory that um, I, I tend to hold, which is that Lady Macbeth and her husband did have a child and it um, died. And um, there's a scene, I'm trying to remember, where she talks about how um, her breasts are still swollen from milk. So she would either have recently given birth or had recently miscarried. Um, but it is like acknowledged in the, like, in the play, they have no children and Macbeth has no heir. So um, I do think, um, I think it is uh, like important that they don't have children. I think it's like very critical to the play. I think, um, I believe that they already did have a child. I believe the child died. I believe that that's um, kind of a source of some of the conflict between them. There's even a theory I've seen that Lady Macbeth is suffering from postpartum psychosis, which is a disorder that goes beyond the postpartum depression and has led women to um, attempt to commit murder often of other children or of uh, their spouses. So yes, I do think that that, um, does play a significant role. Oh, that's really interesting, thank you. Do you think, um, it's kind of a follow-up question, but do you think the psychosis could have anything to do with like the whole subplot of her possibly mourning Lady Macduff and her children before the soldiers go to murder them? Oh, that's an interesting. Um, I'll be honest, I haven't as much thought thought about it in that parallel but given that there are like parallels of the women in leadership then that would that would make sense I don't I don't know if I would necessarily say that it, I don't know the morning aspect is interesting I think um from from what I, I read of her, I see her as very self-centered and very wrapped up within her own grief and her own mourning so I don't yeah, I, I, I'm really, I'm really curious about um, that, but um, I think it is entirely possible. Um, I also have a question for you, Kelly. How do you think Lady Macbeth's like death, like the way she commits suicide? How do you think that like plays into your entire paper and everything with like her being almost like a hearken of death for others and her children now even for herself right I think um what's interesting about her death and you see the kind of downward spiral of um her after like her husband rises into power is when she talks about the blood that is on her hands the blood that she cannot get um get away from I think it's significant because kind of the beginning beginning of her uh, journey of evil is, you know, to wanting to stop up the blood. 
Um, I think it's, I think another thing that's super significant with her death is that she goes from experiencing no grief and no remorse to just this, it seems like she's overwhelmed by guilt. She wants to confess to God and no one can hear her. Um, whereas her husband starts out very much, um, you know, kind of timid and not super sure of himself. And then he stops having any remorse. He is um, I, from the Shakespearean archetype, he's, you know, he's stepped into his role as a male and she has fallen, Lady Macbeth has fallen into a grief um, and into a sense of guilt, probably because, you know, she is a woman and, um, you know, Shakespeare could be commentating on, you know, just because like she tried to have this demonic uh, conversion of herself, that doesn't mean that it's going to be permanent. It all eventually falls apart at the end. So I don't know if that kind of answers your question. No, for sure. So I had a question for all panelists and you can either just shout out or kind of go in the order that you presented in if that works easier. But um, so a lot of you use plays or um, text. How did you feel the research was in this presentation? I know that maybe you had to cut down or just, you know, in general, like what did you find interesting about the research and what resources did you use? Um, <clears throat> hey there, everyone. Sorry, I'm Alex. Um, uh, so when I was when I was researching um, uh, for my the presentation on Titus Andronicus, um, I suppose what was the most fascinating to me actually is that um, uh, in kind of diving into to Rome's history, and I had I had known this just a little bit before actually um, uh, taking on the play for my presentation, but I I didn't I'm not really a historically minded person unfortunately, so I didn't know very much about this. Um, but the actual <clears throat> Lavinia's death has always kind of been a um, source of, of contestation, really, in the literary community because it's it's one of the details within the play that is really highly historically inaccurate. Um, so the the Roman tale of Virginius, um, even though it, it relays what it does about the uh, the the value of female virginity, um, there was never in practice uh, um, an actual established um, routine of like ritual slash honor killing um, for defiled women in Rome. And in fact, uh, quite the opposite. Um, uh, in fact, like especially Roman elite women were typically um, uh, given weaponry in case there was the concern that they would be quote unquote defiled, um, especially if they were traveling into um, areas wherein there was that there was that concern about possible criminals um, attempting that on them. And that, that was definitely interesting to me to consider the ways in which Shakespeare was basically writing his own time into his play. Um, yeah, that was that was probably one of the most interesting components actually of my research. I would say uh, for mine, um, with kind of diving into this research, it definitely um, sent me down more the, I never expected to be super fascinated in medieval medicine, but since I wrote the paper, I've taken two classes on medieval medicine. So uh, I guess that's kind of my thing now. Um, but no, just kind of the idea of like what they believed about um, sex and reproduction, it turned into like a whole pet project about um, alchemy and witches um, and just kind of like what it means to be male and female. So I think um, for me, one of the things I really appreciated most about the research I did was how it kind of helped me discover all these other things um, in the medieval like realm that I'm super fascinated by. Um, yeah, so for me, my focus was really literary. So um, the professor that I was working with really encouraged me to not look at any secondary scholarship first and to um, do my own analysis of what was going on in the scenes that I wanted to examine. And that was a really good experience, um, being able to sort of dive deeply into different language patterns that I was noticing and making intertextual connections with other things we had read in the class and other texts that I was interested in bringing into this discussion. Um, so I think having the chance to sort of dive deeply myself into um, what these uh, plays were saying without consulting anyone else's thoughts. Um, and then after that, doing a very thorough investigation of what other scholars had contributed to this discussion and whether or not they agreed with that preliminary analysis that I had done. And then sort of adding on another layer of um, historical context and understanding things about the ways in which Roman theater operated and what it was uh, attempting to achieve in the society. And um, in particular, this question of 
uh, analyzing modern social issues from a Roman perspective. Um, I think that was a really interesting component of the research that came out uh, in some of the secondary scholarship and some of the things that I then went back to my preliminary analysis and sort of adjusted some of the points that I was making and eventually came together with this this idea of the, the paradox of cloud time critique. So yeah, it was a great process. I have a question for Alex. So um, in uh, Titus Andronicus with um, Livia, there's a obvious parallel to from Ovid, uh, the rape of Philomela and the cutting out of her tongue so she can't speak. But um, from what I remember, the difference is that in Philomela, it's just her tongue, whereas Lavinia, it's also her hands. Do you have anything more to say about kind of the significance of that, what you think Shakespeare was doing in this parallel to Ovid that was taken a few steps further? I didn't know if you had any like kind of more to say about that. I think, you know, I'm, I'm really glad you touched on that um, because that that was actually one um, kind of detail that I unfortunately did need to remove from this abridged presentation, um, especially the the fact of the matter being that Lavinia herself sees that connection. Of course, she's it's it, she uses that story to reveal to Marcus and her father and Lucius, I've I've been, quote, unquote, defiled. And um, and it is it is interesting to consider. In part, I do believe Shakespeare made the choice to have her hands removed because um, it definitely reinforces her as as a human. And I hate to say this, but it kind of as a piece of meat, she's rendered all the more useless um, by the fact that she can't use her hands. Um, and I think it really reinforces this image of Lavinia as as an item, as something that doesn't have the ability for her own agency. And that's exactly why she defies the expectations that are increasingly mounting on her um, as, as, as a woman, but also as a disabled individual within the play. Um, but I also I also think the point there um, on, on Shakespeare's end is that Lavinia being almost kind of a foil to her to her father in many regards, um, it's important for them both to be physically disabled. And so the removal of her hands definitely, you know, his the removal of his hand later on is an echo of her own mistreatment and um, her own disfigurement. Um, and so I think it's kind of a combination of both. It's um, it's 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 making Lavinia a more human and a more a more visibly disabled kind of version of Philomela that doesn't have really the satisfaction that Philomela's story does. Um, and then simultaneously, it's a way of, of reinforcing her relationship with her father and how they, they differ from one another and simultaneously are experiencing very similar physical consequences. Thank you so much for your question. Of course, thank you for addressing that. I'm so glad that, yeah, you also had that in, included in your research. So another question I have for all the panelists, kind of a follow up um, to the previous one I asked is, what inspired this project? Have you previously worked in this area before? Have you previously done a paper or presentation on this topic? And then additionally, once you've done this, have you felt that you can um, kind of broaden your horizons and have another project on the way? Or do you, I think we talked about what you found interesting. So do you have some new focused interests that you previously um, didn't have and want to explore in the future. Thank you so much for your questions. Um, you know, uh, this, I won't lie, this is actually kind of an old project on my end. I did this, uh, if not last semester, the semester before that. I'm sorry I'm a senior and everything is blurring together for me. Um, but uh, I, I, I love this project. I love Titus Andronicus, um, especially because it is one of those plays that I, I do think doesn't receive enough limelight. But at the same time, it's, it is a very disturbing play. And um, especially because so much of the prominent research on it is now kind of dated. Um, I don't think I would probably pursue another project specifically with Titus Andronicus. But I do love Shakespeare. I do love Shakespeare. And I'm definitely now um, considering... Um, I'm kind of weighing my options as I enter, as I as I consider entering grad school. But um, if I find myself keeping on the literary track, I definitely think I will be pursuing more opportunities to dive into Shakespeare analysis in the future. So, yeah. yes, so that was that was a fantastic question. Um, for me, this project was also a bit older. Um, I started working on this. Uh, 
almost near the beginning of the pandemic. So uh, Lady Macbeth was my best friend during, you know, the pandemic. That was a great time. Um, and I think kind of going forward with it, um, my concentration in my major is medieval texts, uh, specifically in the realm of like alchemy and occultism. So like the magical side of medicine and the magical side of science um, is something that has uh, definitely going forward is something that I'm fascinated by. I definitely would like to look into Lady Macbeth more. I would love to see more um, scholarship done on her. And, you know, I would love to provide more scholarship done on her. So um, definitely Shakespeare and especially like, you know, how he portrays women um, in tragedy for sure. Um, yeah, sure. So I wrote this um, paper as part of a Roman comedy course. Um, and it was really exciting to me because after reading a lot of Roman comedy throughout the semester, we were given the opportunity to really choose our own topic and dive deeply into a text that, or a problem that we wanted to learn more about. Um, and I think addressing this question of how uh, playwrights really use the theater as a vehicle to do something beyond just the practicalities of performance and learning about how the different elements of the text and also of the staging process actually came to life and had meaning um, for people that were in taking in the play as Roman spectators and also for people who are reading the play now as, as scholars and as people who are um, looking back into the past to see what it can teach us about the present. Um, so yeah, just being able to investigate this, um, this meaning that, that the text had that I hadn't really thought about before doing a lot of this research and coming to see sort of the fine points coming together um, and really understanding just the, the extent to which it can be applicable to so many of the questions that we're facing now um, the classical past has always fascinated me, and I think its ability to shed light on what's going on now is really important, and definitely that connection between then and now is, is something that I'd really like to continue working on in, in my further research in whatever capacity, whether Roman com comedy is part of that or, or not. Kind of going off of that question, what are your guys' like plans for this summer? Like, Do you plan on doing research, something else? So um, I'm doing something kind of funny because uh, my two BAs are English and Gender and Women's Studies, but I'm now considering going to Psychology for Masters. So this summer, my 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 summer project will actually be, ideally, an internship with a um a current psych professor. Um, so I won't unfortunately I won't really be continuing up on my literary studies at least not this summer. But you know maybe maybe future future endeavors, uh, especially grad school, will give me that opportunity. Yeah, um, this summer, I don't have any intentions of working on research, um, I guess, kind of officially, I'll uh, be working. Um, uh, I'm a, So I'm a junior, next year I'll be a senior, I'm planning on afterwards of getting a JDMA, so concurrently getting a law degree while getting a master's in literature, because I'm an academic masochist. So uh, I'm going to be working um, for a law firm that I've worked for for the last couple of years, working as a legal assistant. So I will be learning a lot about people and uh, will definitely be doing research from the legal perspective, but uh, nothing with uh, literature or academia, unfortunately. Um, yeah, sure. So I'll also be switching gears a little bit. I'm taking a few courses to get credits um, for next semester um, and also doing research on the side, but in a very different area, um, more focused on linguistics and Latin paleography um, with one of the professors in our department here. So, um, oh, my classes. Um, so I'm taking a mix. I'm getting a science credit because one of the requirements for my degrees is that I take some of uh, the graduate credits at our, our school. So I need to um, finish like the distributional stuff. So I'm taking an anthropology class and then I'm also um, starting German for reading. So that's a graduate course and like that prepares you to do German um, texts from like a, a more research perspective and less from a conversational perspective. And I'm also really excited for a workshop um, that I'm doing at the Divinity School um, about faith and reason. So a interesting eclectic mix of academic pursuits this summer that will somehow come together into a cohesive whole. <laughs> I have another question for Ileana, actually. So I know you focused a lot on Lady Macbeth's transformation kind of being demonic as opposed to based in gender, but I was wondering if any research came up while you were writing this about kind of queer theory and how she embodies LGBT themes. 
Thank you for that question. Um, I originally, uh, I mean, completely honest, when I originally uh, approached this research, I was looking for that perspective. I was looking for a more queer perspective on it and what her transformation was. And at least with most of the research I did, um, I don't think there's really a transformation of female to male that we see in Lady Macbeth without completely villainizing that transformation. And it's it's entirely possible given like the time period, if, if there is any of that sense and there's a villainization of it, um, you know, that's just, that might've been Shakespeare's MO. Um, but from the research that I did, I think especially with the understanding of medieval medicine, uh, medieval ideas of biological sex, I, I don't really see anything of her um, you know, kind of wanting to do that transformation. So I think that, um, you know, queer studies in Shakespeare are important. And I think those are seen in a lot of uh, places. I don't necessarily see it in this transformation um, or if there are, it's nothing really positive. It's very uh, negative and uh, demeaning. And I didn't, what little research I did that was trying to take it there I didn't see it as a fruitful exercise. It seemed like there were other um, ways to approach Shakespeare from like with the uh, like queer studies mindset that were a lot more productive. So I don't know if that answers your question. It does. Thank you so much. That was a great response. So I got to ask Alex, um, um, how do you feel about, if you've seen uh, Gary, the sequel to Titus and Jonicus? Um, have you looked at that or, um, it was a sequel, I think on Broadway and I went to go see it and I, it's, you know, very much a comedy. I just wondered anyone who has seen like maybe a sequel of, or, you know, a version of their uh, research if you liked it, how you feel about that, and maybe a new perspective on that play, et cetera. I've never seen, did you say it's called Gary? I've never it's seen Gary. Gary. I've never even heard of it but now I have to see it I 100% okay. have to see it um but uh an answering answering kind of the latter part of your question um that's actually part of the reason why I did interview the film Titus into my um, presentation only because it's definitely a unique adaptation when compared to a lot of stage performances that are very cut and dry. And frankly, kind of do little to play with the, the play. Um, that's a that's a funny way. Of phrasing that, but um, I, I think you all rather know what I mean. There's Titus Andronicus is one of those plays that is not, not um, very heavily tweaked in most of its adaptations, and I think especially that it's because it is such a disturbing play. It 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 is a hard thing. to adapt um and that's exactly why tame war's adaptation is so ambitious issues frankly um especially because of it it, it so successfully
actually playing with the um, hi the historical backdrop. For Titus Andronicus, um, and, and particularly with, again, its depiction of Lavinia as being what I would kind of see as, as um, uh, one of the more like it's, it's ironic because she's definitely not a standard Shakespeare her heroine, but Tamor's out of draws out the components of her that would otherwise allow her to be. So yeah, thank you. And this can be to other panelists too, if you have response. <laughs> so I've seen a number of uh, adaptations of Macbeth. I know there's a film called Lady Macbeth that's like sitting in my Amazon Prime watch list. Um, um, as like a recovery for after going through all of this. Um, but yeah, it's always interesting to see how they're kind of portrayed. Um, I've, like, I'm also, like, a theater kid. I've always wanted to be Lady Macbeth, so I don't know, like, it's, uh, it, it's definitely interesting seeing how other people, especially Shakespeare, everyone wants to adapt. Shakespeare differently. I've seen a number of like stage productions of Titus and it's they're all wild. They're all wild. Um, yeah, I'm not familiar with any adaptations. of the Melee Sclerosis in particular. Um, but one thing that I found really interesting throughout the research and throughout the course that I took on Roman comedy was um, tracing elements of Roman comedy that have found their way into more modern works, particularly in Shakespeare. And I actually do bring up Shakespeare um, in my later part of the essay, which I didn't have a chance to. to read. Um, but yeah, a lot of these questions of social order um, are definitely made fun of in, in Plautus and then picked up on in other ways through Shakespeare. And I discovered some really interesting works through this course um, that adapted elements of um, the motifs and themes that come through in Plautus. So apparently Machiavelli wrote a comedy, um, which not many people know, called The Mandrake, and it's um, it's a really interesting play that takes a lot of inspiration from the classical world. Um, definitely recommend it if you have a free Saturday. Um, and uh, Marriage of Figaro is also deeply influenced by some of these themes that I observed in Plautus. So yeah, just seeing how the pieces sort of fall um, along the tradition, um, it's really interesting to see just how that evolution took place. All right, in the last about like three, four minutes, um, if anyone has anything they would love to say that you didn't get to in your presentation, uh, feel free to do so now, or we could take maybe one or two more questions.
Okay, I'll bite. Um, one element that I was, re- it was a very last minute cut for my paper, but I just wouldn't have been able to keep it with time. Um, there's an amount of uh, scholarship done on Lady Macbeth that actually theorizes her as being the fourth witch of the play. So the play opens with the three witches and, um, you know, kind of like their incantations and how they affect Macbeth. And so there's a number of um, scholars that like kind of look at Lady Macbeth as a witch right before her unsex scene. scene, She talks about um, Raven's croaking, which some people have seen as evidence of her, of like that being her familiar. So um, yeah, that's definitely an interesting element. And, um, And also because the witches are like seen as women, but they have beards there's definitely a lot of like conflicting you know gender presentation um and so yeah that that was an element of research that I definitely would love to bring awareness to that like that's a theory people have but that would have been my whole paper so or my whole presentation so Um, yeah, one thing I didn't get to bring into my presentation was the particular comparison that I have with Shakespeare um, to the way that Palestro is operating, as I argued. Um, with uh, There's, I think, a direct parallel with Shylock um, in Merchant of Venice, where, again, you have this idea of a figure who simultaneously pushes the limits of, of social order, but also um, falls into our expectation of them. So there's a very paradoxical and very subtle, subversive kind of questioning going on that um, I really appreciated seeing played out against the backdrop of meta theater, um, which as I realized, having read the trial scene in Merchant of Venice many times, I read it again and sort of found in it a meta theatrical framework that I think supported this very paradoxical presentation. Um, and that was a really interesting thing to, to be able to read a scene in a totally new way and see that kind of framework working in a way that I hadn't expected. Those are some fantastic answers. Uh, Thank you so much again. We are out of time, but you did amazing and you have a good rest of the day. Thank you so much.